believe that God has come to us as a child, making our weakness his strength, securing our salvation by becoming one of us, blessing us with a steadfast Savior. We believe that God has birthed righteousness and justice into the world. We believe that God calls us to participate in this reality of love, transforming us as disciples to go out into the world, challenging us to see everyone as nothing less than his beloved children, all of us. This we believe. This we seek to embody in word and deed. Let us worship the Messiah, the Lord, God with us, Emmanuel.
Well, we are in Christmas tide, the first Sunday after Christmas. We're between, of course, Christmas and Epiphany. We're in the 12 days of Christmas there. During Advent, we've been thinking about this theme of Behold, and even though Advent has passed, I wanted to conclude the Behold series with Behold His Miraculous Birth. And so we've heard from John during Advent, the Gospel of John. We've heard from Philippians. We've heard from Paul during Advent. We've heard Luke's story of Jesus' birth on Christmas Eve. And today I want to read Matthew's story, beginning with the 18th verse, chapter 1 of Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. Santa Claus dominates the cultural Christmas in America, and to believe in Santa Claus, you have to believe in miracles. I mean, deer fly at light speeds, and this rather heavy-set gentleman makes his way down our chimney, and perhaps even more remarkable, back up, and visits all the children in the world in that very manner in one night, Christmas Eve, and brings them presents. That's, that's, that's what we're told. If you believe, if you really believe, and you're a good boy or girl, of course, then Santa will bring gifts. It is a wonderful story. It's a delightful story, of course. And it has as its seed the stories of Nicholas of Myra, which are some wonderful stories there from the fourth century. But of course, that's not the real story of Christmas. The real story of Christmas is about a miraculous birth. 2,000 years ago, the birth of Jesus. Yet it is quite a story as well. As you know, it is filled with the miraculous. Actually, quite a few miracles. There is the visitation of angels. There is Joseph's dream, actually. He has two dreams. We can't forget the flight into Egypt. There's the star of Bethlehem. We could go on and on for quite some time. In the very first verse that I read from Matthew's gospel, we are told that Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And then a prophecy from Isaiah is given to support that idea, of course, and to remind the reader, or those who first heard the story of Jesus' birth, that his birth was a fulfillment of Scripture, and that he indeed was, is the Messiah. Luke emphasizes that Mary was a virgin in his story three times. Can you believe it? And, of course, it's a reminder, it's all this information, it's all given to us to remind us that his was no ordinary birth, that our God is a God of miracles. And indeed, I would say to be a Christian is to be a person that, yes, believes in the miraculous. It's one of our most basic fundamental beliefs. That Jesus is not just some impressive historical figure, but rather he is a supernatural person. This is one thing essential to the Christian faith. Christianity begins with the presupposition of the reality of miracles. Now, they may be rare. They may be inexplainable. They may appear to be 
improbable. But the Christian story, not just the origin of Christianity, but the story of Christianity, the story of Christians, is filled with the miraculous. And it's essential into understanding not only our own identity of who we are as Christians, it's essential in understanding who God is, the nature of God, the identity of God. But maybe you're questioning the virgin birth. Maybe you're a college student. Maybe you are an adult. And you said, well, you know, it's a quaint story. I believe in God, but the virgin birth, I'm, I'm not so sure. Well, let me just say that if you are one of those folks that question the legitimacy of the virgin birth, you're in pretty good company because Mary was the first not to believe it. Of course she was. We didn't read that part. We were in Matthew's gospel. But if you look to Luke's gospel, when the angel appears to her and says, Mary, you are God's favored one. You are going to bear his child. She didn't say, well, thank you. I really appreciate this honor. No, she said, wait, how can this be? For I have never been with a man. It was contrary to the laws of nature. Again, a basic tenet of our faith is a belief in miracles, the miraculous. And doubting the miraculous? Well, it's normal for us as human beings, which means it's pretty normal for us as Christians to doubt, at least at times, the reality of miracles. Someone once suggested, he who never doubted, never thought. I wonder, those who are listening today, maybe you've doubted not just the virgin birth. Maybe you've doubted God. Maybe you had a brilliant, likable college professor and he challenged you. Maybe you've read some books that have challenged you. There have been some very popular books in recent years, and of course, some of them uh, say fiction right on the cover. Others aren't quite as open about that. You know, The Da Vinci Code, uh, the Hidden Codex is another one. Or maybe you've heard people like Sam Harris lecture. You've listened to some podcasts, and it's planted some seeds of doubt, and you've begun to wonder. Or maybe you've struggled with pain and difficulty and examined human suffering, and you begin to wonder, is all of this really true? And as it pertains to Christianity and the story of Jesus, born of a virgin, the son of God, someone who grew up and then did things like turn water into wine, brought the dead back from life, he himself being resurrected, I, I just don't know. Again, I think that's okay. Doubting is okay because doubting is normal. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. Again, Mary doubted. She didn't automatically believe that she was going to be the vessel through which God would enter the world. Everyone knows the disciple Thomas by his moniker what? Doubting Thomas. Why? Because he didn't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Did you know that John the Baptist doubted? He didn't in the beginning, and then he kind of wavered. All of these people doubted, and more, yet they were used by God. They were essential to Jesus in his life and in his ministry. I have a friend years ago who said to me, John, it's difficult for people as smart as me to believe all of this. And you probably think that's rather arrogant, but I know what he meant. He is a brilliant person, scored off the charts for college, but yet, you and I both know some brilliant people who've not been believers and some brilliant people who have been believers. Intellect has nothing to do with whether or not a person is a person of faith or not. And that's why I always say it's contrived, this idea that science and faith are in conflict. Science and faith are not in conflict at all. I certainly think of my myself as a believer in science. Most of you are as well. There have been some brilliant people who've 
written some tremendous books who have not been believers. There have been some brilliant people who've written tremendous books who are believers. Again, if you doubt, be encouraged by the fact that the Lord has always been very patient with honest doubters who are seeking truth. When John the Baptist doubted, Jesus didn't say, John, you know, I am so disappointed in you. No. He sent messengers to John and he said, tell John that the lame walk and the blind see. He knew that John would have known these were some of the prophecies of what the Messiah would do, who he would be. That's how Jesus responded. The Lord has always been very patient with honest doubters. He's always invited people to investigate on their own. He's not afraid of our questions. In fact, the recurring theme that we find in Scripture over and over again as it pertains to Jesus is come and see. Come and see for yourself. That's, that's what I always tell people. Come and see for yourself. There was a cigarette commercial years ago. This is a horrible illustration. There was a cigarette commercial years ago, and I think it was a, a rather cheap cigarette, and their slogan was simply, just try it. <laughs> I guess they were wanting to capture, capture people's attention by saying, you may not think it's much, but if you try it, you'll find it's a, a great cigarette. Well, come and see, come and see Jesus. Open yourself to the possibility of God, and you may discover something wonderful and wonder-filled. I will tell you, I think we waste a lot of time trying to prove God, trying to prove the virgin birth, trying to prove the resurrection. Now, in theology, we have some language. We have words like the hypostatic union. That was accepted at the Council of Trent in 1545, I believe. You can look that up for yourself and see what that's all about. It's how we explain theologically how Jesus was both human and God. And then, of course, Athanasius, one of our church fathers, wrote this beautiful essay on the incarnation of the word. Again, how Jesus could be the embodiment of God. Oh my goodness. The words that he uses, the imagery, it's so beautiful. In recent times, there have been preachers like John MacArthur and Josh McDowell, and they write these books, you know, the case for Christ, the case for the resurrection, and they, they try to use Old Testament prophecies to prove that Jesus is who he says that he is. But all of this, and I say this with no disrespect intended, is a great futile exercise in missing the point. You can't prove the virgin birth. You can't prove the resurrection. You can't prove the miracles that are in the Bible. It's all a matter of faith. I like what Norm Geisler wrote. God is not asking you to take a blind leap of faith into the darkness. He's asking you to take a reasonable step of faith into the light. I will say that God has given all of us ample evidence to believe, sufficient evidence to satisfy those with an open mind to make a reasonable decision. So that's what I want to leave you with today, this thought, Advent, Christmas. These are seasons filled with the miraculous, but really, Every season is a season of miracles for Christians, for those who believe. If you'll just allow yourself to see and recognize and take hold of those miracles that are there waiting for you. Yes, waiting for you. When I checked myself into rehab in 1993, I spent some time with the intake counselor there, just the two of us for quite some time. And she was perplexed. Many of you know this story. Here I was in the ministry with this problem. And she said to me, I'm curious, did you ever pray for God to take away your desire to drink? And I sat there for a moment and I thought, you know, I never did. And that's what I told her 
And she was curious. Why not? And then I said, because I thought maybe he would take away the desire for me to drink, and I couldn't imagine life without drinking. Friends, sometimes we get in the way of our own miracle. And I know many of you need a miracle today. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction of some kind, or maybe you are lost in grief. There's been some tragedy in your life. Maybe it's the loss of a job, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a family member or good friend, and you're struggling to move forward. We don't, we don't get over those kinds of things, but God does give us the grace and the power to move forward. Maybe, maybe you need a miracle of healing in your body or in your spiritual life, a miracle of healing in your emotions because of something that's happened in the past, a healing in a relationship that needs to be mended. I don't know what that is, but will you reach out for that miracle today? There is someone that many of you know, someone who's a part of our congregation, who's caring for a loved one who's very ill at home. And some of you know what that's like and know it's very difficult to watch the life of someone you love ebb away. She hasn't left her home for many months, but she said to me recently, I get a gift every day. Sometimes it's the sun, sometimes it's a phone call. Yesterday was a hibiscus. But then she added, but I have to look for it. Yes, sometimes we have to look for the miracle. It's right there. God is ready to impart the miracle, the gift, the blessing, the reassurance of his presence, of his power, of his love, whatever it is that we may need right now. Recognize it. Seize it. Behold. Behold the wonder of his coming, the power of his coming. Behold his miraculous in your life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Good evening. Welcome to Highland United Methodist Church's Christmas Musical, the children's ministry version of It's Christmas. Thank you for all the parents and children who made this possible. Christmas is carols that we sing with joy, celebrating the birthday of God's little boy. Happy birthday, Jesus.
is hope for the whole human race. I hope it's in Jesus who died in that place. We have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Christmas is receiving the gift God gives, Jesus his Son, so that we may live. From God to you. Christmas is Emmanuel, the son's special name that says, God's with us. <gasps> That's why God he came. came. Shepherds leaving their sheep to go see God's son in a manger asleep. The shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. Luke 2.20 Christmas is telling us that Jesus the Savior. Okay. Jesus is Savior. He was born long ago. Born long ago. Hold the tea up. Hold the tea up. And say, Jesus is the reason for the season. Say it. Jesus, Jesus is, is the reason, reason for the season. Christmas is a manger in a poor kind of star. The baby who sleeps now is God of us all. Christmas is angels filling the sky, praising the Lord on earth and on high. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Christmas is special. Don't you agree? Jesus, God's Son, came for you and me. For God so loved the world that, that he gave, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Heart the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Christ is born. 
in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory.